In today's video, we're going to be looking at the severe consequences that are happening as a result of the Red Sea attacks. But this is actually a lot broader than this. In today's video, I'm going to do what I do best, and that is not to focus on political propaganda, but instead to focus on facts and how this will actually affect you and more importantly, your families. We're going to talk about everything from geopolitical to military, um, all the way through to inflation, how this is going to affect you in your pocket. So firstly, I think it's probably best that I give you a little bit of context around the Suez Canal, because I think a lot of people started to become familiar with it back in 2021, when we had just one ship that, uh, uh, you know, however you want to look at that scenario, sort of blocked the canal and the, the, the consequences of that on inflation and all sorts of other things that happen as a result. So what is it then? Well, the Suez Canal very simply is a waterway that connects the Atlantic Ocean to the Indian Ocean through the Mediterranean and Red Sea. As a result, the Suez Canal provides a shortcut when traveling between Europe and Asia by sea route. Now, prior to the canal being built, ships actually had to go all the way around the Cape of Africa. This obviously added on a lot of time, a lot more risk. Over time, a lot more ships have been using the Suez Canal. And if we just look at the statistics here, in 2022 alone, there were over 23,000 ships that navigated the Suez Canal, raking in 7.9 billion for the Egyptian government. Uh, so we also have to look at the geopolitical aspect here what has just happened with Egypt, they have just joined the BRICS alliance. Who are the US whenever you see anything about the Houthis or Houthis uh, rebels attacking ships? Who do they keep talking about? And we've been mentioning this or I've been mentioning this for over three weeks now on the channel. And everything is about Iran. It doesn't matter what is happening, whether it's Houthi, Houthis, rebels attacking ships. The US is blaming Iran, saying that Iran needs to be stopped. Even with some of the recent cyber attacks that were proven to be from North Korea, certain Western economies blamed Iran. When the Hamas-Israel conflict first started with that initial attack, who was to blame? It was Iran. So I think it's pretty clear the way this is going. And I think the, the rhetoric here is really ramping up between East and West, uh, predominantly US, UK, EU against Iran, not necessarily because something has changed with Iran. This has been going on for a long time now, the Iranian government backing different groups. I think this is a, a lot more simple. Some people consider it to be very complex. I think it's a lot more simple. What have we just seen? We have seen the joining of Egypt and Iran, one of the two out of five new members of the BRICS alliance. So who do we now have? We won't go through all of them, but you now have Russia and China, who I think is going to be the next big sort of conflict region. We've already have Russia as a proxy war with Ukraine. So Russia is already at war with the, the, the West via proxy via Ukraine. But China hasn't yet happened. We've talked about that forecast with the China invasion of Taiwan, where the US will intercede and then we'll see some sort of military conflict, thereby having another potential proxy war via Taiwan with China. It's only a matter of time until we see this major breakdown between East and West. And I believe it's already underway right now. And the Suez Canal and everything else that's going on is uh, sort of leading us towards that. Look, these uh, groups, rebel groups, terrorist groups, whatever you want to say, there's nothing new here. This has been going on for decades. It's only now that the Western media is focusing on these groups and what they are doing. Now, I want to bring it back to a couple of really important things, because what do I do? What makes this channel successful? I don't just talk from my own opinions because, you know, opinions are cheap. Everyone's got opinions. I talk from a basis of economics, of finance, of statistics, but more importantly, of history. And that's how I'm able to forecast things that might happen in the future, because I look at historical perspectives and evidence of the past 
to then give more accurate forecasts for the future. Now, we can't always say that all forecasts will be accurate. Most good forecasters might get 20% right, but they do give us a good idea of what might occur. So one example I want to take you back to happened between 1967 and 1975. This was following the Six Day War or the Third Arab-Israeli War that started on the 5th of June 1967. Egypt closed the Suez Canal for eight years. Yes, eight years. The decision affected the global oil trade severely and set off the energy crisis of the 1970s. I think we all remember what happened during the 1970s, uh, which really uh, culminated in 1973 with that huge oil crisis. Only once the debris and the mines were cleared by the authorities did they reopen the canal on the 5th of June 1975. So we know straight away from this event we have one example, and we'll talk more about oil prices later, of what may occur later on. We also remember what happened in 2021 where the 400 meter long ran aground in the Suez Canal. And we remember what happened to supply chains. This caused huge disruption to supply chains and pushed up prices right across the board. This was one of the contributing factors to higher levels of inflation. The Suez Canal passes $10 billion of goods every single day through that canal. And there was over 100 ships blocked up that just couldn't get through until that uh, larger ship was moved. Now, another thing I want to draw your attention to here is that the Houthi rebels may be using this as a political sort of tool here. I haven't heard anyone else mention this, but when I was thinking about the new BRICS alliance and Egypt being in there and the sheer amount of revenue that contributes to their GDP from the passage through the Suez Canal, yes, ships have to pay a huge fee to actually go through the Suez Canal. Maybe this is also being done to disrupt that GDP because Egypt is set to increase their GDP as a result of being part of BRICS. The same with Iran. What we're seeing is this strengthening of these eastern bloc of countries. And this is only the first tranche, by the way, or, or we could say the second tranche. The first was your BRICS themselves. The second tranche was the five new countries, making 10 countries. Argentina, of course, decided not to join at the last minute. And next year, we're expecting another five or more countries to join the BRICS alliance. Now, if I were America or the European Union or the UK, for example, I would be a little bit concerned about this alliance that's growing all around. Eventually, if all the member states that want to join do actually join, we're going to feel very, very surrounded if they do begin to start cutting off the West, which is the plan. It is to sort of stranglehold the West and uh, make the West lose its grip on global powers. You see, the Eastern Bloc is really playing a long term strategy here. It's like a very advanced game of chess, where I do believe that globalization will eventually not break down, but it will definitely start to have cracks in it, which will push up costs in other Western nations, because our labor costs are a lot higher than they are in China and Southeast Asia and India, for example. And if you think of global goods that actually come from the East to the West, via the Suez Canal every single year, it is quite staggering. This is what helps to keep prices down in Western countries. If you're watching from a Western country, the Suez Canal contributes to your goods costing less than they would do otherwise. In fact, if we look at the statistics here, the Red Sea is a critical global trade route with about 12% of the world's total sea transport around 10 to 15 percent of global trade and 30 percent of container trade passes through this channel every single year and if you want to know who it really is vital for it's europe it's the european union second to that would probably be the united states so what has actually been happening then well we know how all of this started and now we're seeing the consequences, the responses to this. We're seeing everything from drone boats packed with explosives to helicopters with uh, teams landing on the, the boats. And initially when I talked about that, I said something just didn't add up about that. 
that shouldn't have been able to occur so easily with the helicopter and boats and all sorts just getting on that ship. What actually transpired was the security team didn't protect the ship properly. You know, there was issues with radar and all this other stuff. Now, again, there was so many things that happened there. There was three or four failures in one go. It makes me say either it was the most incompetent crew ever to sell the ocean or there was something behind that. And since then, this hasn't really slowed down. There's been missiles. There's been all sorts of things. In fact, the USS gravely shot down two anti-ship ballistic missiles which were launched by the Houthis from, they, they claim Yemen, although there is some sort of discussions around this. Some people say they were shot from uh, elsewhere. But either way, this is doing the job that I think is intended. The US and UK, I think it's now seven different nations who are putting together a strike force. and. One of the things that, again, is drawing a lot of controversy and the United Nations are now involved is that the uh, the strike force wants to go after not just the, the Houthi rebels, but they want to start doing um, airstrikes, is what they're calling it, in other countries, Yemen, for example, Lebanon. In fact, one of the first things that David Cameron has been doing since he has come back is blaming Iran and saying that we need to hold Iran accountable, whatever that means. Uh, when he says that, whatever that means, I'm wondering what does that mean? Drop in the comments below what you think, but it's most probably going to be um, a combination of financial, political, and maybe even military, which would not be good at all if the UK and US and some other nations did decide they were going to attack Iran directly, because Iran has started to gain a lot of allies now, and they are now part of BRICS, which isn't a military alliance. It's more of a trading alliance. But it doesn't mean to say that they won't become some form of a, a military alliance later. If anything, I think that's highly probable. Because what happens is that everything is geared around money. Money makes the world go around. If some of the BRICS nations are being affected by Iran being sanctioned and being attacked and their, their trade and other things disrupted, and that causes knock-on effects to China, Russia, Saudi Arabia, some of these other countries, I think we could see some issues there later on. Not immediately, but later on, especially if there is conflict militarily that increases between some of these other nations. Now, another thing I keep seeing in, in comments and on forums and things like that, which isn't really being addressed, is why is it so difficult to defend these ships? People are saying, surely the US Navy or the British Navy or you know NATO and people like that can just defend these ships. Surely it should be easy. These ships are huge. Well, uh, no, it's not quite that easy. People look at a map and they just think, you know, they don't really grasp the scale of that map and the sea and the land mass there and the, the structures. And not just that, it's the guerrilla warfare tactics that are used. You look at Afghanistan and when the Russians were in Afghanistan a long, long time ago, they just couldn't win in Afghanistan because the Afghanis used guerrilla warfare tactics. Even in Afghanistan in the most recent conflict with NATO there, the US, UK, etc. The Afghans still were using guerrilla warfare tactics. I remember being in Camp Bastion in Kandahar, one of the spearhead units to go in there. And every Every single night you would hear a dun dun uh, dun that's what you'd hear every night and then you have to jump out of your bed and you know get under the concrete bomb shelter that was just normal it happened every single night without fail and then the QRF the quick reaction force would go up and they try and find these guys and they never could. This is guerrilla warfare tactics. It's not designed to wipe out the enemy firing one mortar shell. It's designed to, to, to wear people down, wear the soldiers down, wear down their morale. So when people are asking, well, what's the point? Why are they just, you know, these rebels going out in a boat or helicopter and just, you know, trying to take out one ship? What's the point? It's not to win a war. These are guerrilla warfare tactics. And as a result of this, we've now got seven shipping companies that have suspended the transit through the Red Sea. So these are BP, British Petroleum, Maersk, Hapag Lloyd, CMA, CGM, 
MSC, that's Mediterranean Shipping Company, Evergreen, OOCL, Orient Overseas Container Line. So these are huge shipping companies, and I'm pretty certain we're gonna see some sort of impact in the West on prices if this continues, uh, emphasis on the word, if because no matter what everyone's saying and oh we're gonna you know biden or sunak or david cameron or whoever saying we're gonna take care of this we're gonna destroy the rebels we're gonna uh, protect the ships and escort them and all they're not they cannot escort this amount of ships it is physically impossible sure you can escort some of the ships but you can't do all of it you know the sheer cost of moving these huge military naval vessels let alone tra transporting and escorting these huge container ships you just never know where these guerrilla attacks are going to come from another side effect of all of this then is the insurance companies the ship insurance for transit is absolutely soaring. Previously, it was around 0.1 to 0.2 percent of the ship's total cargo. That was the insurance cost. It's now gone up to 0.5 percent. That is absolutely huge. And not just that, war risk assurance has increased more than a thousand percent since the escalation of the attacks. This high insurance cost is leading some shipping companies to forego insurance altogether. And now Goldman Sachs is coming out and warning that oil prices could go up significantly, which would push up inflation to unprecedented levels is the word they are using. They say this is because around 7 million barrels of oil travel through the Suez Canal every single day. And if they have to go further around, yes, they'll catch up, but there'll be that initial knock-on effect and the additional cost of the longer journey. So Goldman are anticipating up to a 20% increase in oil prices. But it's not just energy that's affected, it's goods and services. I was just looking up today some of the UK companies that have talked about supply chain disruption. We have clothing companies, we have furniture companies, logistical companies. Some shipping containers are up over 20% already. Some people are, are saying they've gone up 60% already. JD Sports has already downgraded its profit numbers for this year. And although some commentators are saying this could be a good thing for the world because it means we'll have less reliance on global supply chains and globalization. Yes, in some ways, I, I kind of understand what they're saying, but it won't be good for people in terms of pricing. People, we've already seen pricing go up to a very high level due to inflation over the last three to four years. I don't think anyone wants to see their standard of living eroding even more than it has over the last few years. And yes, some people might say, well, I'm willing to pay extra prices if it doesn't, uh, you know, send money to these other countries and things like that. But the majority of people, I simply don't think would appreciate the higher prices. Now, there's one final thing we have to bear in mind, and that is the geopolitical risk that we're seeing now as well. It was just announced last week that Malaysia is actually blocking Israeli ships from entering the port. In fact, the story goes on to say that Israeli ships cannot dock at any Southeast Asian port right now. I haven't seen the evidence for that. I'm not sure if that's 100% correct, but you can see what we are dealing with now. We are dealing with the knock-on effects of this conflict that is still ongoing. And as I said previously, I think it's going to continue. I think this is a decade of insecurity, of global geopolitical conflicts, and I don't see this getting better. I see it getting worse before it finally gets better. So that is you up to date. You now understand the implications of the Red Sea route and everything that is going on in the region. Thank you so much for watching. Take care, God bless. I will see you on the next video.